So, as Patrick said, the title of my talk is, is What It Means to Be a Chemistry Teacher. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to clearly define that for you, but I'll give you some suggestions from my experience, and we, we can maybe discuss that further later. Uh, again, that's the same information there, again. So what I'll do is I'll start off with a little bit of background, how I came to be doing this stuff and, uh, and why I'm doing it now. Uh, I will then introduce some key aspects of education research which I think are pertinent to chemistry teaching and then we'll think about how that research can inform what we do in the classroom and how we build sort of mental frameworks that help us to be able to do that. And then I'll finish off with some suggestions for points which address uh, the title of the talk. So just to say, so as Patrick mentioned, I started off uh, at university level as a school teacher fellow. Before that, as Patrick said, I, I did a PhD and a postdoc. I then went into <coughs> teaching, and I really had a tough time for the first couple of years. I think that's an experience that many teachers have. And then it started to get a bit easier, and I started looking at other options, and I was very fortunate that a job came up as a school teacher fellow at the University of Southampton. And the, the idea was to look at the sort of traditional university teaching that they were doing at Southampton, which, let's be honest, wasn't inspiring students and was causing retention problems. They wanted new ideas from the creative and adaptive school teaching environment to come in and update what they were doing at university level. And another aspiration was to then feed some of those ideas and approaches back into schools. And over time, I've been able to do a bit of that. Some of the resources we've created have been used by thousands of students in, in schools and colleges in, in England. Now, when I first went there, uh, there was a bit of an issue because a lot of these guys were not that keen on changing. It was a battle. And any of you that have tried to lead change in an educational setting may have had similar experiences. The key question that people often posed was, what's the evidence? Why should I do this differently? I've done it this way for 20 years and it works. Maybe. So the idea was for me to try and find evidence. And that's when I started to see that actually in the educational research literature, there was lots of evidence. Some of my colleagues were a bit sceptical about the value of that evidence, but at least it gave me some ammunition, and it did help me to break down some barriers. And over time, I've started to try to do more research myself, but well, that's a big challenge because I'm primarily a teaching fellow. Uh, just to say, so we'll fast forward now. I've been at the university since 2007, so last year, I was giving talks at two <coughs> conferences. That I annually run a conference for teachers in Southampton. Uh, and I was invited to give a talk at the RSC SAFE conference in Birmingham. And I was doing some research at the time, basically asking this question, to what extent are teachers familiar with key aspects of education research that have implications for teaching practice? Very vague research question, but you'll see how I addressed it as we went on. I took this opportunity to pose questions to the teachers as I was talking to them and to collect their responses and then paint a picture. What I'm going to do with you today is actually pose some of the same questions through the voting system, but I'm not going to get you to give me any verbal responses, although I will give you the opportunity to respond later on if you have any thoughts and comments you want to add. I'd love to hear from you, so please do do that if you want to. So we had about 70 teachers there. We've got about 70 teachers here all together today, so that, that's a fantastic uh, cohort site. Now, I'm just going to put this out there now. Uh, beware, there is some edgy jargon in this talk. This can often be a turn-off for educators. I, I think what I generally expect when I come to Scotland is that people are a bit more receptive than some of my colleagues down south, um, but we'll see. And on that note, just to start off our first question on the voting system, if you can go in now, you should have, and I can see this is the number of you that are currently logged in, uh, you should be able to enter one word, or two or three words if you prefer, but one word would be better. How do you feel about educational research? And this is a, a, a little question type that will generate a word cloud. Uh, so we'll see how your results or your answers compare to the ones we had this morning. So you see this is telling me now we've got responses coming in. And don't hold back, it's completely anonymous, so I'm not going to be tracking it back to you. <laughs> So again, anyone who's not logged in, any web-enabled device, web.me2.com, enter the nine-digit code, and then you'll be able to answer this question. So I'll give you another, another 10, 15 <coughs> seconds, and then we'll see what we've got. Okay. 
Okay, so I've got 22 responses. Last chance, 24. Sorry, we're going to go now. Let's see what we've got. Always takes a little while. There we go. Interesting. Well, I say interesting, that's quite a big one, but you can see it's, it's the same size. Obviously, the size in a word cloud tells you the, the number of responses, if you like. They're a bit more negative than this morning's ones, aren't they? Don't you think? Uh, I'd have to do a bit, of, uh, a bit of coding on these, a bit of analysis to see, but I think, I think we've got a more cynical cohort here, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes as we go along. That was a warm-up. So th this is, now we're looking at the questions I was posing to my teachers uh, during the conferences last summer. And the first question I asked them was, how familiar are you with the concept of pedagogical content knowledge, otherwise known as PCK? So if you can just quickly respond, which one of these options most closely matches your perspective on that question? Obviously, I will tell you what it is later, but um, I just want to find out what we know at the moment. Okay, so last chance. Okay, one more maybe. Let's see what we've got. Okay, so actually, I think that's a few more than we had this morning. I think that, that actually we had a few more saying that, that um, sorry, a few fewest people saying they were familiar with it earlier, more down this end. Um, what I'll do with, with you now is just show you the responses from the teachers in England that I got last summer. So you can see that's not too dissimilar to what we had here. More people are down at this end um, than we have up at this end. I think PCK is a really important concept for teachers, and that's why I asked this question. Um, what we also did, as I said, with the teachers in England was we got them to respond to some text prompts as well. So we got some qualitative data which we analysed. I'll just share some of that with you now. So I'm just looking at this, the people who answered A and B. We asked them to tell us where they heard about it. And for those that answered A, we wanted to know how it impacted on their practice. So I've just tried to pull this together. It's quite a crude coding. You can see actually quite a, a small number of people out of the total <coughs> cohort of 70. Uh, only five said they came across this concept in their initial teacher training. Um, only three said they got it through CPD or study. Actually, more teachers have found it I guess later on in their practice, either through reading or through online social media, coming to conferences like this. Um, if we then look at how it impacted on practice, actually quite a lot of people were saying that they, they thought about PCK when they were planning lessons and preparing their, their class activities. That is exactly what PCK helps us to do. So I'm glad to see that teachers were looking at that, but it was only nine out of 70 who said they were doing that. And we had a few that said they used it in their reflection on their teaching to evaluate what they were doing. And that's a theme I'll come back to later on. Um, I'm not going to answer your question now. <laughs> I'll answer it later. Um, so what is PCK? Where does it fit in? Now, this is where some of my uh, colleagues at Southampton start switching off because they, they think that you, you can't create models for these things. Um, and we'll see some examples later on of teachers who have similar views. But I really like this stuff because this shows you how complex it is to be a teacher. We have these knowledge bases that we need to develop we don't have these when we start, we develop those as we progress through our teaching. Uh, then we have other things that relate to topic-specific professional knowledge, various things that happen in our brains that allow us to use that information in our teaching, and, and how we use that to actually relate to our students, that's the PCK. The PCK is the bit that we all enjoy in our jobs, where we're in a classroom with kids who want to learn, and, and we are transforming knowledge in a way that they can then assimilate that learning. And that's where your PCK comes in. The better your PCK, the more aligned your thought processes are with those of the students, and that's the ideal you want to aim for. Uh, obviously, it's, it's very difficult to do that with a class of 30 kids who are all at different levels, but a skilled teacher is able to do that effectively. Now, the term actually originates from Shulman, and he referred to it as subject matter knowledge for teaching. The subject matter knowledge is, is our chemistry knowledge, our pure content knowledge that we have from our degrees and any other development that we do. Uh, but the relationship between PCK and subject matter <coughs> knowledge is unclear. Actually, Shulman had them as separate things, but lots of other researchers subsequently have put the two together in one package. Actually, the reality is that all these knowledge bases interact with each other. We can't just develop one in isolation. We probably need to try and develop 
more of them at once. Um, because good teaching depends on knowledge across all of those areas. Um, but anyway, that's something else we can talk about later if we need to. There is a lot of evidence that says that PPK <laughs> is accrued through experience, and there's some recent research on this here. Uh, but I believe, and other researchers have said this as well, that the right sort of instruction can help teachers to develop this PCK and accelerate that process. We'll talk more about that later. So there you go, there's a bit of theory there for you. So having talked about PCK, I then went to ask the teachers about another very important concept in my view, uh, which is the use of the concept of levels of representation. So here we're talking about terminology such as macroscopic, submicroscopic, and symbolic. Um, so if you are familiar with these, you can answer either one or two, or if you're not, you've got three or four there. Which, which one of those responses is most closely aligned with your perspective? Again, if you've been logged out, remember this is your login info here. Okay, so <coughs> nice chance if we can get those responses in. Okay, let's see what we've got. Interesting, so I think that is a little bit different from what we saw this morning. Um, not hugely, but I think we've probably got more down here than we had. Um, so that's not an issue. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's just the chance for me to appreciate where you are and I can adapt as I go along. I'm using my PCK, if you like, by learning about my audience. Um, so anyway, these, these concepts, if I, look, if I show you the data from Southampton and from Birmingham, the two conferences in the summer, you can see it's slightly different from what we saw here. The thing that actually stands out as a difference for me, which I'm quite pleased about, is if you look at the Southampton cohort, I've been running that conference for 10 years, and I do quite often talk about these concepts and how they are important in teaching. So the fact that more of the teachers are saying they're familiar with it and impacts on their practice is actually a good thing, and it shows these kinds of conferences can have an impact. And hopefully some of you might go away with some of these ideas and use them. But we still have a significant number down here. Again, we got some qualitative data, so we asked those who'd answered A and B to tell us where they heard about it, and those who answered A to tell us how it impacts on their practice. I was quite shocked to see that only four of the teachers, and that's across the whole cohort of around 70, said that they'd heard about this in their teacher training. Now, obviously, I'm not asking you that, but that's something you might reflect on. Did you come across this in your teacher training? I guess... I might well have answered C or D myself, although I know, if I think back, yes, I definitely encountered this, but it didn't impact on me at the time. I was too busy worrying about behaviour management, getting my practical set up safely, making sure I got all the paperwork in. I'm terrible with paperwork. So all those things worried me a lot more than thinking about stuff like macroscopic and submicroscopic. That only came later on for me. So I probably would have not said this either, even though I have encountered it there. Obviously, then, the other teachers were saying that they picked it up later on. Um, so, again, through CPD or their own study, some of them were doing master's programs. Uh, there's lots of stuff online, coming to conferences again, uh, reading stuff, doing some research. So, all of these are things that teachers were doing that were exposing them to this kind of theory. Now, in terms of the impacts, I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but one that stood out, the, the most common response so the teachers were using this theory to distinguish in their teaching between levels of representation, explicitly in their teaching. So when they're writing a, a simple equation, for example, maybe using some submicroscopic representation <coughs> to show what the equation represents. So linking those different things. We'll, we'll pick that up in the subsequent topic as well. This is a really important one, though, because if you look at the literature on PCK, Using it in explaining models and concepts that relate to models is particularly important, especially with the relationship between the submicroscopic and the macroscopic level, because when we use the, the models, particle models, for example, that, that's what we're doing. We're showing the particles and thinking about the, the bits that we can't see. So chemistry could be thought of as trying to understand the unseeable, and that's what we do with these kinds of models. So just to illustrate uh, the principle here, I've got some examples of different types of representation. Here's a, an aluminium bar, that's a macroscopic representation. 
so that we can see, touch and feel. <coughs> Here's a submicroscopic representation, although some people describe that as symbolic. You might go away and think about that. But it's a visualization of a molecule. So we're illustrating a molecule. I see that as submicroscopic. Here we've got something that's clearly symbolic. We're showing formulae in an equation to show a change. Um, but you know, some people classify these things differently sometimes. This one here can be uh, in two areas, really, because when you think about free energy, it's describing a macroscopic phenomenon, if I said that right. But some people also classify this as symbolic. So you can see that one of the problems we have here is, is that the researchers can't always agree on what's what, and that can put people off. One of the great things about research is that it's okay to have different opinions, so don't worry about that. Anyway, so we have all these different representations. As I said a minute ago, um, we need to be able to visualize and understand the unseeable, and we also need to be able to, uh, I guess this is representing quite a complex thing. If you drew out all the molecules here, <coughs> that's quite a complex model that we're trying to represent with a rather simple equation that has letters and numbers in. But to a student who doesn't know what we're doing, that can be problematic. Of course, the other thing to think about here is that, that young people develop their initial ideas about science from things they observe in their own world. So you might see a puddle of water evaporating, and you might interpret that as the water disappearing. And actually, my experience of working with primary school kids is that they do actually have some understanding of what's going on, but they don't always use the right terminology. And that's another issue in chemistry. Obviously, when we talk about the submicroscopic world, it's very abstract for students, so they can't always assimilate those ideas easily. So it's very important as teachers to be mindful of that and, and to incorporate that in our teaching. And of course, once we get to symbolic levels, there's kind of like a specialist vocabulary, and some of the terms we use in chemistry are, are not real words. They're not in the dictionary. <laughs> but, you know, they work for us. And I like this, like the word intermolecular. Break it down, think about what it means. It, it, it makes sense, right? But we do make up words. <coughs> so let's move on. This, this follows on. Um, so I just reset that. How familiar are you with the concept of Johnson's triangle, or the triplet, as it's sometimes referred to in chemistry? So that's very similar to what we saw, and I've, you'll see I'll show you the other data in a minute. A few of you up here. I, I was a little bit disappointed. I, I had a hypothesis that I was coming to Glasgow, and Johnson's a Glaswegian. He sadly passed away last year at the ripe old age of 93, and, and he's kind of the grandfather of educational research in this area. It was him that came up with that macroscopic, submicroscopic, and symbolic um, model, and that actually is what, what Johnson's triangle is, but we'll come on to that in a second. As you can see, you're not that different from my other teachers. So I guess my, my concern there is it, it does relate to this. Okay, I'll just show that for a second. Um, and then just think about this. It's Johnston's triangle. As an organic chemist, many of the reactions that we learn are named after the person that discovered them. <coughs> it's like we're celebrating that person. They've got their legacy in that reaction. So I think that we should celebrate Johnston. You know, he, he, is, he came up with this. He's helped break this down for many, many chemistry teachers and many researchers who are now building on what he did. Um, so let's try and remember that it was Alex Johnston that did this. And he was basically illustrating the relationship between the three domains. Um, I've just given it a bit of exemplification here. Remember that the macroscopic is what we can see and handle and experience. We invoke these particles, atoms, molecules, and ions to get a mental picture that helps us to explain the behavior we see in the macroscopic world. And then we use our symbolic domain to simplify things, condense things down into a format. And chemists are very good at that. You could say chemists are lazy because we like think of a skeletal formula in organic chemistry. I'd say we're very efficient, actually. Um, but there's a lot of implicit information in our symbolic <coughs> representations that students don't always pick up. And that's a bit of a problem. So I've represented this with water. Obviously, this is what the one we're most familiar with, the macroscopic world. Um, students can struggle when we start showing them molecules and getting them thinking about. And you can see why. I mean, if you looked at that, you wouldn't be thinking that there's gazillions of these things 
whizzing around in there with you. But as chemists, we've got lots of evidence that we have molecules which look like this if look is the right term. And of course, there's our symbolic representation. Now, as teachers, we can seamlessly switch between the different levels. That's, that's not an issue for us. Don't forget, we've ended up as chemistry teachers. Probably means we were quite good at chemistry. Most of our students are not blessed with, with a natural aptitude for chemistry, I think that's fair to say. And this is one of the barriers for them. Well, they struggle to move between these different domains. So we need to try and, and be mindful of that in our teaching. That's where the PCK comes in. But we're aware of this, and as we're transforming our knowledge in a way that students can then assimilate it, we're breaking down these barriers by helping them make the transition. And we can do that by drawing molecules when we're writing equations. I do that a lot. There are many other ways we can do it. So I'm going to now illustrate that uh, with a demonstration. Hopefully, I didn't check actually, but I'm sure we've still got plenty of liquid nitrogen because your dewers are very good. And to demonstrate good health and safety, I'll put another clip on. I had to dispatch a postgrad this morning to find a lab coat big enough for me because the one they gave me first of all didn't fit. Right, just bear with me a second. So, here I have a dewer of liquid nitrogen. What temperature is our liquid nitrogen? Anyone able to tell me? <coughs> Minus 196. <coughs> Pretty cold. Good. And would someone, we'll make it a little bit interactive, can someone tell me what is now inside the balloon? Mostly nitrogen, a bit of carbon dioxide, still quite a bit of oxygen actually. But it's all in what state? We've got a gas, right? Now what I'm going to do is put the balloon in some liquid nitrogen. And when we're teaching, of course, we need to be mindful of the knowledge level of our audience. So imagine if we were doing this with kids at primary school, which I do regularly. Think about the level of discussion we might have. They know that there's a gas in the balloon. When I ask them what will happen when I put the balloon in the liquid nitrogen, they'll often say, it'll pop. Well, actually, this morning, it did. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll work a bit better this time. As you can see, what would you, how would you describe that effect? What's happening to the balloon as I cool it down? It's contracting. So if I actually leave it in there for long enough, and I've got to be careful, I should really be wearing these gloves, which were kindly provided for me. But hey. <laughs> Um, I'll get it down to the minimum size that I can, and then when I take it out, if people towards the front, if you look at the bottom of the balloon, it's hard to see because of the vapour coming up, but can you see anything inside the balloon? There's some liquid. Yeah. So the gas that was in the, in the balloon has condensed and formed a liquid. Now, I would imagine <coughs> that my primary school kids could tell me something about the volume occupied by gases and the volume occupied by liquids, and we could then discuss that in, in trying to describe a reason for what we observe. But that would be the level we'd be talking about there. If we were going to do the same thing with students who were studying for hires or A-levels back home, we might start talking about pressure. So as I'm cooling this down, what's happening to the pressure inside the balloon? It's decreasing. It's decreasing. The, obviously, atmospheric pressure remains the same. So Therefore, we've got this extra pressure forcing the balloon to contract. So there's not enough pressure inside the balloon to counteract it. We condense it into the liquid form where the pressure is at a minimum. Then the air starts to boil again. We can see it boiling. And we can see that what's happening to the pressure inside the balloon now. Right. So we are being mindful of the background knowledge that our students have. And we are then using that in our um, sort of description of what we observe. I've been quite careful not to explicitly talk about molecules here because what we'll do next, this is a macroscopic <coughs> way of considering that demonstration. Um, I'll just skip past these because this was here in case it didn't work. Um, what I'll do now is I, I, I'm going to take us into the um, submicroscopic domain. So have, how many of you have used these FET simulations before? couple hands going up, so write it down. Yeah, there's a lot of these. 
They're, they're all good, but this is one of the best ones. And you know, when you do it, and this is what students do, if you give it to students, they'll click on everything and play around with it. That's what we need to do as well, right? Anyway, so we can see here, we have our, our traditional sort of particle model. I'm <coughs> gonna leave it at this, this is neon, where we've got atoms effectively. You can put oxygen in, but actually it kind of clutters it a little bit. So I'm just gonna leave it like this. Now we can see there that the particles are all moving around as you'd expect in a gas. They're colliding with each other. They're colliding with the walls of the vessel. That's what's causing the pressure. Um, and that's at a fixed temperature, admittedly some way below room temperature here. Now what I can do with the simulation then is I can start changing the temperature. Uh, if I want to start cooling it down, like I did when I put the balloon in the liquid nitrogen, you can see the temperature's going down. What's changed about the motion of the particles? So they've slowed down. If we start thinking about kinetic energy, they've got less kinetic energy now. When you look at the collisions between the particles, you can see that in some cases, they're not just bouncing off now. It looks like the molecules are starting to stick together because they no longer have enough kinetic energy to overcome the intermolecular forces. Obviously, if I was doing this for students, I'd be getting them to tell me this. I wouldn't be telling them. We can still call it down further. And you can already see, actually, what, what I was hoping to start to see was it, it looks like droplets are starting to form. So if you think about that process of <coughs> condensing the air inside the balloon, it would have been forming droplets that then aggregated to form the pool of liquid that we formed at the bottom of the balloon. We can carry on calling it to see that effect happening more starkly. So now we can see it's starting to look like it's, it's almost between a liquid and a solid, actually. But if I cool it right down, as, as the particles lose kinetic energy more and more, you can see now they're no longer able to overcome the intermolecular forces. They're vibrating in a fixed position, um, in a lattice. I mean, this is the kind of behavior we'd expect to observe for a solid. So we can actually, on a particle level, replicate what was happening here. Because actually, the other thing you couldn't see was, of course, there is some CO2 and some water vapor in here. And that will form a solid on the inside. And you can see frost inside the balloon if you look closely when it's cooled down. So all of this can be used to explain that. So that you can see there that, that I've modeled how you can use this. What's a PCK there? I'm not saying that's perfect. I think it could be done a lot better. Uh, but obviously, if I had more time, um, I wouldn't rush through it all quite so much. And I'd be teasing those things out from you. Okay. So... How did I do it? Well, I tried to break this down. Again, this is not definitive. This is something I just knocked together in 10 minutes, sort of thinking, okay, what was I actually doing there in my teaching, reflecting on what I was trying to do? The subject matter knowledge, this, these are the fundamentals that I was communicating. This is the stuff we know about that area of chemistry. The pedagogical knowledge, these are the sort of instructional techniques which I know I can use generally across different topic areas. And then the PCK is kind of the specific things I was trying to be mindful of in what I was saying and, and the things I was trying to tease out from you when I was asking questions. So this is the skill, isn't it? It's this bit. This is really transforming the knowledge and helping the students to, to build their understanding. These slides will be shared, so you know, if you're interested, you can look at them more. So having then gone through that, I then asked the, the, this question to the teachers. Having considered this, how important do you feel it is for teachers to be familiar with PCK? Okay, last chance. So that's interesting. So we, I think this morning we only had people answering one and two. Um, no one down here, but we did have some down there when I taught when I did this in England. So I'll talk about that a bit more later. <coughs> so there's nothing wrong with these answers, right? Uh, the beauty of these things is that everyone is entitled to their opinion. So it's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm not. Don't take anything I say as a judgment. Now. Having considered uh, those examples, what about Johnson's triangle? And I guess implicit in that is knowledge of levels of representation. <coughs> okay, last 
chance. So again, similar, although actually more down here, which is interesting, right? So that again, no, nothing wrong with that. I'll share with you some similar opinions in a second. But you can say overwhelmingly, most people, like we saw in England, most people are up with the A and B. This was for PCK, and this was for Johnson's triangle. But as I say, in both cases, we did have some people who were down in these areas. Interesting, none of them this morning. Now, we did get some qualitative data here. So the question I asked was about how did people think we could deliver training in this area? If people thought it was important, presumably we have to do something about it. So where could we do this? And when, in a professional journey for a teacher, should this be done? I wasn't necessarily expecting it to be in initial teacher training, PGD on this side of the border. Um, but that was what most people were saying for both PCK and for Johnson's Triangle. Obviously, Johnson's Triangle, I agree, but for PCK, we do certainly need to learn about it in our training, but really the development is probably going to happen later. You see quite a few people were acknowledging that by saying in later years through CPD. Uh, how could we do it? Well, some people were saying provide resources, we could set up small group discussion and workshops. The, most, the biggest response was mentoring. Obviously, you cannot underestimate the value of a good mentor in a school. When I trained to teach, it was my mentor that got me through. I, I, would, I would have dropped out otherwise if it wasn't for her. And what little PCK I probably did develop in my training was because she steered me in the right direction. The thing that's quite notable is that very few people actually <coughs> identified the idea of reflecting on practice. And that probably is the most powerful way of developing our PCK. Certainly for me, it's only the reflection that I've done since I started reading the literature in more detail that has, has improved my PCK. Now, th these are the ones where people said they thought these things were unimportant. Here, and you might, this, may be, this may chime with some of you who <laughs> responded in such a way. Some people here saying that, that knowing about these concepts, uh, they don't believe that that will make someone a better teacher if they can't incorporate it intuitively. I think we've already said that PCK is developed through experience. There's certainly some truth in this, but is it completely true to say that we can't support it through some sort of intervention? So personally, I think that we do need to know about it, but that's my view. Someone here saying it's not necessary to label these concepts. Good and outstanding teachers will include these ideas from experience. Yes, this is what happens quite a lot. That is true. But if we don't label them, how can we do something to support them? So again, I, I don't agree with that, but it's a valid point. Uh, this one here, someone's saying it's an intuitive process of teaching. It absolutely is. There's, there is truth in that, without question. <coughs> a measure of the experience of the teacher, yes. It is a vital skill, but developed through practice rather than learning. Yes, that's absolutely true. But can't we enhance it through learning? So again, you know, I, I, I will have a good conversation with someone about that. But this is a completely valid point, and, and this is what happens generally, so nothing wrong with it. Okay, so just to quickly summarise before I, I just focus on something else briefly, what we found from that research was that an overwhelming majority of our participants thought it was important that teachers are familiar with these concepts. Only four reported learning about it during ITT, that's for levels of representation, 11 uh, for PCK. I'm not hammering teacher trainers here. A question came up this morning from someone about that it's more likely that it was forgotten. In my case, I definitely came across levels of representation, but I didn't remember doing that <coughs> until 2011, which was about eight years after I trained. Uh, again, we saw a majority of teachers felt that these concepts should be covered in initial teacher training, which surprised me, but yes, we should definitely do it. Um, but very few of them identified the fact that reflection was important. So in terms of looking forward, there's a lot of interest in this area, lots of papers coming out at the moment. I will send some links, actually, for some things, if, if people are interested in looking at it further. <coughs> I'd like to see how we can characterise PCK better so we can find out where we are and what we need to do to move to the next step. Subject matter knowledge is really important. It's a bit of an elephant in the room. I know that even with a PhD, that my subject matter knowledge was actually quite poor. I carried lots of misconceptions through my whole education, which I didn't really in, uh, fix until I started teaching. Uh, and then... I really think reflection is the key here. How can we encourage teachers to reflect so that we can accelerate the transition from novice to expert? I think you'll all become experts anyway, right? But is there a way we can help that to happen a bit quicker? Because that's going to benefit our students. 
Now, I'm just going to whiz through something else now. Park that. I've got another bug there that I always just like to talk about, and I'm going to demonstrate the principles of SMK, uh, subject matter knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, and PCK through this. So how many of your students want to study chemistry so they can do medicine? Is this a common issue, right? You know, this happened all the time for me when I was teaching. I'm glad it's not just an English thing. Well, actually, if you want to have, make breakthroughs and make a difference in the medical field and improve people's health, you can do it through chemistry. Let's just think about penicillin, which is a really simple molecule with functional groups that we teach at school level, I guess at higher or advanced <coughs> higher level up here. Um, we can use these representations, these are uh, symbolic representations, uh, sorry, submicroscopic representations, I should say. Uh, this is showing a chain of sugar molecules. So the cell wall of a bacterium is made up of these chains of sugar molecules which are linked together through these oligopeptide chains. They're fairly weak links individually, but as there are so many of them, it makes the cell wall very strong. So we can look at some basic chemistry here to explain how penicillin works. If you deprotonate the carboxylate group, we get a negative charge which is attracted to a positive group on the cell wall. And this group over here then is in close proximity to the <coughs> amide group, uh, which can lead to hydrolysis. And, and that forms a bond which weakens the cell wall. We can actually show it here with the molecules, right? So we can talk about a hydroxyl group, uh, amide group being hydrolyzed, and this ionic attraction here helping to hold the molecule in place. So certainly something our students can understand. Got a little video here, so I guess in a way, although this is microscopic, it's not submicroscopic because you can see it with a microscope. So in a way, in a way, you could say that this is macroscopic, right? Because it's not submicroscopic, but that's another one we can debate. But on the left here, you can see this is where we've treated the bacterium with penicillin. It's weakened the cell wall. We can see that the bacteria are effectively exploding. The, the, the cell wall is breaking down, and their innards are being dispersed. Over here, you can see there that the bacteria were, were multiplying um, without any, uh, anything stopping them. So that's showing how chemistry plays a key role <coughs> in the medical field. Um, if we then think about drug resistance, obviously that's the big issue we have at the moment. It's something we need to tackle. We'll have millions of people dying from routine operations if we don't fix this. So it's all over the news. You don't need me to explain this. You're all familiar with it already. It's going to have serious consequences. So again, we can use basic chemistry to explain what's going on here. In resistant bacteria, the amide group in penicillin is hydrolyzed by a special enzyme. So through a random mutation, the bacteria develop the ability to, to emit this enzyme, which effectively intercepts this. Sort of like you use a Star Wars analogy or something, couldn't you? Obviously, you've got to be careful because you're anthropomorphizing, if I can say it, if you do that. But I think that's a really nice idea, the fact that, that the bacterium is able to destroy uh, the, the penicillin that's coming in. So what can chemists do about that? We can modify the penicillin. We can put different groups on. We can use chemistry that a higher or advanced higher student can understand. And chemists are going to play a key role in this. Medics will too, but they can make a difference through chemistry. So we'll skip that. We all know about uh, resistance, because I know I need to move on. Um, obviously, chemists will play a key role in developing <coughs> new antibiotics and understanding the mechanisms by which they work. These are all old ones now. We've not generated any new ones for quite a long period of time. So we really do have a, a very urgent need here. So chemistry, get your students studying chemistry to solve this problem. Of course, I always just like to share with people that nature is a fantastic chemist. Chemists have gone and analysed these natural products. Does anyone know what artemisinin is used for? An anti-malarial. What about vancomycin? That's an antibiotic, very potent antibiotic. Anyone know what taxol is used for? Anti-cancer, yeah. And these are all made in these natural living organisms. Obviously, chemists have found ways to make them, but we can also use these as the basis for things we can modify and then use as medicines as well going forward. So chemists have a huge role to play in this. I'm not going to go through that. I'm just going to leave that there, so if you do look at the slides later, you can see what I think about the subject matter knowledge, the pedagogical knowledge, and the PCK that I've just whizzed through in that very short presentation. But my key message and moral there is, study chemistry and solve the world's problems. And I'll just finish off with these, these points here. So what it means to be a chemistry teacher, we're instilling a sense of curiosity about the world around us. 
and understanding why things behave the way they do. I'm really glad I did chemistry for that reason. Uh, we're helping students to develop an understanding which enables people to make evidence-based decisions. There's not a lot of that going on in the world at the moment. Let's, let's try and do a bit more of this. Um, we're, we're providing a gateway to experience by relating the microscopic world to the sub-microscopic world, which determines what happens. And we're communicating the role of our discipline in this rapidly changing world where we've got a key role to play in creating a sustainable future for mankind. Humankind, I should say. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think we've got one or two minutes for questions. <coughs> Anybody in the audience have a question for... I have one. I know you have one. To start with, definitely not the same one I asked this morning. Um, you very kindly did not uh, cut me off in the middle of the top four. So um, I kind of had a, a question. We, we talk about pedagogical content knowledge, and, and some teachers that you serve may not be aware of it, but were you finding that people were using it but just didn't have the words for it when questioned in a survey? Absolutely. So that was quite interesting. When we had the paper questionnaire they were filling in as we went through the talk, some of them went back and annotated their previous answers. So if they said, I don't know what it is, and I don't use it in my practice, they came back and said, oh, now I know what it is. I know that I do use it. I just didn't know what it was. And actually, I look around the room. We have some experienced teachers here who, who will have fantastic PCK, some less experienced teachers who will have good developing PCK in some areas. One of the things you'll find is your PCK will improve in the areas you teach the most. The areas you don't teach very often, and you might not have such good PCK, but you will develop it over time. I, again, we can have a debate about it, but I think knowing about it will help you to look for what you need to look for to improve your PCK. Um, we've got time for one or two more questions. If we can. Absolutely. And again, the reason I did that was this research was inspired by the fact I was asked last year to go and give a talk on Johnson's <laughs> Triangle and, and why I thought it was important for teachers, because people know that I'm very passionate about this. And I was surprised, even though I'd been talking about this for a while, that people didn't know. But of course, again, it, but you saw, when I asked about levels of representation, far more people were aware of it. So again, my, the moral of that story is, let's celebrate the educational researchers the way you celebrate Kleisen, who came up with the Kleisen condensation. Or crazy, like, the, anyone remember the Knobnagel reaction, yes, yeah, it's pronounced like that. <laughs> if we can remember him, we, we can remember Johnston, right? And I'm sorry, I'm being very presumptuous by saying him, but I'm fairly sure Knobnagel was male. But we need to get more discoveries by females. Look at the look at the audience here, right? So, anyway, any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. And if you have any ideas for other things that we could do the same treatment with, then email me. Patrick's going to give you my email address. So, thank you all very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.